All right. Uh, welcome to the American School of Public Service, uh, Shalini Viahala, uh, uh, our, the CEO of the San Diego Policy and Innovation Center. It's really a pleasure to have you here. We've talked offline. We've learned a little bit about your background and your organization, but please tell us how you got to this position, a little bit about the organization, and we'll talk about infrastructure at the end. Welcome. That sounds great. Shaya, thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. And I love the idea of a public service academy because my entry into public service always felt non-traditional. And it's only in hindsight that I've met people who have had similarly um, interesting paths across different lily pads adjacent yeah. to public service and in public service. So okay. by, by background, I am an architect and an engineer by training um, and always had an interest in policy. So my graduate work was in engineering and public policy. And so when I finished graduate school, I moved to Washington, D.C. to start work at a, a think tank um, that focused on resource and environment issues. So think about everything connected to infrastructure on issues related to how do you build big things that serve communities mm. in ways that serve communities. So not just um, bulldozing to build large infrastructure. And so a big part of my motivation in public service has always been connected to issues of environmental justice and mm -hmm. social justice and mm -hmm. systems change, right? So um, when you think about infrastructure, it, a lot of it is invisible. Um, mm -hmm. It's the stuff under the streets. It's really, you don't really pay attention until it stops I mean, working right. and you hit the pothole right. or the water main. It's, it's not a very sexy topic. Nobody cares about no. infrastructure mm -hmm. until water pipes burst. And then you realize, oh, I wish somebody would have planned this better. You know? Right. And then you start noticing or when you right. can't get to work or school, there isn't anybody in the world that needs a highway. You need to be able to get sure. to work, to school, sure. to the people you love efficiently right. and safely. Right. And so I think um, a lot of my work has always been trying to ask simpler questions and in more interesting ways so that you can get to different solutions than where people have been stuck. Mm -hmm. And so... I spent four years at a think tank called Resources for the Future in Washington, D.C., working on a whole range of issues. And then I um, was incredibly fortunate to get a call from President Obama's transition team mm -hmm. and joined his administration in 2009, um, spent some time at the White House in the Council on Environmental Quality, and moved over to EPA, uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, to help lead the um, International and Tribal Affairs Office, which covered... Mm -hmm. The entire world and all Native American tribes it, in the is US. that all is that that's that's, that's it was, yeah, a, it was a tiny portfolio yeah it's very small <laughs> oh my god uh, what what Jeez. made it interesting right was that you know for a portfolio that size you never have enough money um, for all of the course. things that you need to do or you're trying to do and of so course. my team and I kind of cultivated an unusual skill set of just getting very good at finding um, unusual ways to fund and finance right. big projects. Um, right. So, you know, how do you make a road look like part of a water system so you can pay right. for two things at once? Um, or, you know, build water infrastructure that protects against landslides. Right. And so we got to do all sorts of really fascinating things in ways that were very close to communities on the ground, which is pretty unusual for federal service, right? Mm -hmm. You normally end up up here in policy um, right. and don't always have that connection to the ground. So I'm incredibly grateful for having the chance to work with tribal nations wow. to really understand how policy can serve. Yeah, no, it's fantastic. I mean, it, it, I remember working uh, in local government and the city manager once said he likes working with at the city level because that's the closest layer of government to the people. Exactly. Right? Right. Yeah. So federal government, obviously, most people feel pretty removed from any federal action by the time, as they say, trickles down to somebody mm -hmm. on, you know, on Third Street or, you know, uh, on Broadway. Who knows what, what is actually the effect of that policy? So to be able to cut through the bureaucracy and to be able to get effective uh, resolution and uh, satisfaction for uh, individual communities is pretty powerful. And I think that's the role of government. And the more, I think the more we have people like yourself in government, the better it is for individuals, uh, you know, on Third Street that are looking out at this massive country, this complex web of bureaucracy and wondering exactly. what's in it for me? What do I get something? That's right. And I think that um, it's incredibly important in public service to be able to step in and out of these roles and right. keep touching the ground, right? Keep right. knowing what it is that's actually important to communities. So. 
I stepped out of government in 2012 and my timing was either perfect or awful, depending on how you look at it. Because yeah. Yeah. Um, it was a few weeks before Hurricane Sandy hit oh, wow. the Eastern seaboard. And everybody realized, I think all at once that the things that we had built didn't necessarily serve us into the future. Right. Um, and so we, you know, there are all these things that are not very sexy, you know, invisible right. infrastructure, right. procurement, how do you right. buy what you need, not just what you have. Right. <laughs> and, and it turns out I had, um, I had this interesting set of experiences from my time in government that I was able to take and apply to things like you know, really understanding how do you build resilience for communities? Right. What does that look like in right. practice? And for me, one of the most interesting things about it was that when you are successful in a lot of what I was doing, yeah. success is something that doesn't happen, right. right? A storm hits, but the community isn't flooded. Right. Right. And so you have this interesting dynamic and in my former job, right? right. And if, if you solve this kind of problem in the first year, you're applauded. In the second year, your budget goes away because yeah. clearly you don't need yeah. it. It's no longer yeah. a problem. And in right. the third year, there's no staff. Yeah. And so, so we have to find a way to tell these stories differently on how to solve public problems in ways that are durable. Right. And I think you touched on an <laughs> excellent point. Everything is temporary. So success, failure. Uh, but if you build resilient uh, public infrastructure, public systems, uh, mm -hmm. that certainly survive any individual, exactly. um, then I think you're doing a, a great job as a public servant to be able to, as you say, touch individual communities. You can't solve everything. And this is one thing I've learned. Often I see in public policy development, people have these aspirational goals of solving something, <laughs> eradicating something. And I just feel after 25 years in government and all the years you were, mm -hmm. you know, it's just not something you can do in public life. You can touch yeah. it, you can make it a little mm -hmm. bit better for a little yep. bit of time, but mm -hmm. you can't solve it, eradicate it. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes it's just pain management. Uh, and that's the yeah. role of government sometimes and helping your community manage what they have to manage. Well, I think also government is better at recognizing the absence of something rather than right. the presence of something. So if you ask someone <laughs> like, you know, how healthy is healthy enough? Right. Like, there's no good answer to that question. Right. right. <laughs> you right. Know? But if you say that, you know, you're suffering from something, then it's much easier to think about the band-aids than it is about how do you make someone overall better off or healthier. Right. And so I think we tend to have misplaced expectations on government and yeah. policy. Um, policy is not one thing, right? It's all right. these things. It's, you know, where I sat, it was regulation, it was rules, it was compliance, enforcement, right. legislation, right? So it um, it wears all these different hats, <laughs> Right. Um, from from systems to execution. Well, in college, I think uh, my professor called it uh, public policy making the process of muddling through. That's it. You yeah. know? <laughs> because you, you 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 come up with something and it was maybe good in the beginning, but by the time it's actually implemented and the rules are made and and yep. it's on the ground and maybe you've done some you know testing to see if it worked. It just feels like just muddling through and the actual surgical precision that you maybe you had in mind in coming mm -hmm. up with the policy doesn't quite uh, measure up when it's on the ground. Not, not quite. Uh, yeah. And this is why people have mixed feelings about government uh, and well, bureaucracies, right? And I think that's one of the reasons I'm so excited right. about being in this position as, you know, executive yeah. director of this new, um, the San Diego Regional Policy and Innovation Center. At, at the center, we are sitting in this very interesting middle space where we have the opportunity to create a safe space for government at multiple levels to really experiment, to do different things, but also to do bigger things than you might do if you were just looking at it from the perspective of your own municipality's needs or your own agency's needs. Yeah. And so it's one of the things that drew me to public service, but it's also one of the things that's interestingly pushed me in and out of public service. So I, um, when I left, when I left um, the Obama administration, I spent some time working on Hurricane Sandy related recovery. And then I set up my own um, social business. I was railroaded into setting up <laughs> that social business. So I might be one of the more reluctant entrepreneurs out there. But I, um, for 10 years, I worked with cities and governments across the world, helping wow. design and finance infrastructure that helped vulnerable communities be better off. So wow. measurably reduced risk. And so think everything from coastal protections to programs to reduce fire and hurricane risk to um, anything that really where you could move money and shovels. Right. So people were safer. 
right. um, and their lives and livelihoods were more secure. And so I, I ended up, my team uh, were all military spouses and they, um, interestingly, all at the same time ended up in San Diego. And so I moved out as an experiment. Um, yeah. Everybody ends up, just, just so you know, everybody, everybody ends up in San Diego at some point uh, <laughs> from a military standpoint. <laughs> at some point, you end, you, all roads lead to San Diego, but go ahead. I'm sorry. So I had no idea, um, yeah. but was incredibly grateful, moved out as an experiment about seven years ago and immediately thought San Diego was the best kept secret. And I sure. didn't understand why I had been in DC for as long yeah. as I had. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. Yeah, it's good. This is just between us. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've I've been here for the last um, now going on seven years and working right. on problems all around the world. And it's so exciting to me to be able to dive deep in this new role in the center. Right. To actually engage with local government in a way that we could help show the federal government how right. to spend big money effectively. How right. to really innovate across sectors. And so... Um, talking a little bit about how the, the center is set up and how sure. we work, we we just uh, we launched at the end of September, so uh, we are just approaching our hundred day mark. So this is wow. still a very new institution. Yeah, but we are um, a nonprofit of the San Diego Foundation, so set up by the San Diego Foundation with the support of the county. Mm -hmm. And we have a government and agency advisory council that consists mm -hmm. of representatives from all 18 regional municipalities mm -hmm. and um, regional agencies. So Sandag, oh, the port, the airport, MTS. Wow. And so we have our mission is really to bring applied research and policy innovation mm -hmm. um, to some of the region's most pressing challenges. Mm -hmm. And so my description has always been that um, we work on things that are everybody's problem, but no one specific job. Yeah. And so there are these challenges that tend to cut across, like, you know, there's no single person responsible for reducing fire risk right. or protecting against sea level rise or addressing right. homelessness. There are many people. Sure. And there's a lot of good work, but oftentimes the solutions that you need to reach kind of um, a, a comprehensive intervention is something where you have to zoom out. Um, right. And so everything we do is bigger than the scale of any single city. So the things right. that cities can do well on their own, fantastic. Right. Think about those things where you'd get stuck at a kind of an arbitrary right. municipal boundary or some sure. Any jurisdiction. Sure, sure. And we're working at a level below the, the massive projects that Sandag takes on. So this right. interesting middle space where we can look to Washington say, how can we pull more money to the region right. with all this money that's sloshing around with the new infrastructure bill? Right. How can we be responsive to needs from the bottom up? Right. But then how can we build partnerships? Like we announced a, a partnership with the Brookings Institution, yeah. um, which is a Washington DC policy think tank, one of, of the most respected in the world. Sure, sure. Um, and it's the first time they've established a multi-year local partnership. Um, oh. So we're going to be able to draw on their scholars to be able to figure out really what are these kind of strategic ways to approach problems right. that we might not have had the resources to do before in the region. Right. Wow. This is exciting really because I think yeah. I think your, your background <laughs> is exciting in, in many ways, of course. I think it's a dream career in many ways because in many in many respects, and I talk with a lot of public servants, a lot of people that are in government for a long time, and you know, as as you know, we call each other lifers. You know, oh. uh, are, are you a lifer? You know, oh my God, that sounds terrible. Are you a life? What does that mean? You mean a career public servant? Yeah, I guess that's one way of putting it. Yeah. Um, but but I, I think when I reached twenty five years in in the life, you know, I said, oh, that's a nice quarter century to make. You know, a transition yeah. to yeah. the private sector. Uh, but what I'm getting at is. It is I think working in government is fantastic. It's an amazing opportunity at any level. I always, I think one reason I'm doing this podcast is I wanted to encourage, encourage. people to get into public service and find their passion. Uh, it doesn't yeah. have to be a bureaucratic, dry, you know, dry clock punching life. It is an innovative, amazing opportunity to serve your community or country mm -hmm. in any way you can, whatever avenue yeah. you can do it. Do it for as long as you're passionate about it. That's one of my pet peeves. You know, mm -hmm. and I tell people, if you're not passionate about it, if you don't really enjoy serving the public, stop it. Get out. You know, I don't need you in government drawing everybody down and, and uh, uh, cultivating this, yeah. this, this, uh, this perception that government folks are not uh, amazing people. I want you to be as passionate about government as, as you can. So what happens in typical in most professionals lives, as you've experienced, 
you you spend some years and to serendipity or however which way you spend your career and then uh, the private sector uh, opportunity comes up or really a quasi private sector yeah. right so i always mm-hmm. recommend people to experience both sides because Definitely. that's the yeah. best way you can serve your community so you can still be a public mm-hmm. servant but still outside, just sit somewhere else on the bus, not necessarily yeah. in this seat or that seat. You're just, as, as you are, as you're demonstrating, uh, there are ways you can continue to be a public servant uh, mm-hmm. outside and actually serve a role that government needs. That's government right. needs intermediaries because mm-hmm. as, just as the, the core mission of the, the center, government is not comfortable with innovation. That's just a scary yeah, for good reason, right? Reason. You, you want yeah, government to be not Silicon Valley, <laughs> right? You want government to be conservative. You don't want yeah. government taxpayer dollars to roll the dice mm-hmm. with the the infrastructure funding. Oh, let's see how this works out, and then yeah. not, that doesn't work. That's the job of uh, NGOs and, and intermediaries and mm-hmm. public private partnerships to to find avenues where government can leverage private sector. So uh, mm-hmm. from order of magnitude or, you know, kind of the priorities. When I look, check with California legal cities and other cities, you know, they identify three or four top priorities, affordable housing, mm-hmm. in California, you know, infrastructure, as you mentioned, you know, mm-hmm. um, what are some of those top priorities for the center that yeah. you think you can be helpful in? So we have a few. Um, the, the first and foremost, and it's because of the time we're in, is really driving infrastructure dollars to the region Mm -hmm. so that we can fix some of our core systems, but also make smart and strategic shifts so that we don't lock into what we've just always been doing, but we can actually end up in a more climate smart, resilient, um, well digitally connected trajectory, Right. right? So infrastructure investment is one. Housing, housing affordability and homelessness is number two. Absolutely, it is one of the biggest constraints in our region. And there are tons of good people working on these issues from a whole bunch of different sides, as you said, Mm -hmm. within Mm -hmm. government and outside of government. Where we think our center can make a huge difference is looking at those bottlenecks that aren't housing directly, but things that block housing supply, right? Mm -hmm. Or get in the way. So if you think about, you know, what does it take when you're putting infill housing into a municipality, but you have to absorb the cost of upgrading the water and the sewer system? Uh That's a bottleneck. And so where we are, we can actually look for those bottlenecks and look for cross-sector ways to solve them, right? Right. So can you integrate broadband, for example, extensions with streets upgrades or water system upgrades? So you get two colors of money um, to pay for something that might not have had a single one before. Mm -hmm. And so that's a a second area. A a third is very much... um, focused on all the things, and these are cross-cutting, right? So things related to workforce, to climate resilience, to equity. And we're working on a whole bunch of projects where our goals, these are outcomes of things that if we're able to bring, for example, federal dollars to the region for, let's say, retrofitting buildings, Mm -hmm. then how do you make sure you reach the folks who are least likely to get served by other programs. So, Mm -hmm. you know, the buildings that are maybe older building stock with Mm -hmm. residents who are struggling to pay their rent or their utility bills and do things that help improve affordability for for the residents, but Mm -hmm. also improve regional sustainability. Mm -hmm. So that for me, the mental image is like, you know, who's paying for that leaky window air conditioning unit in an old building and has a high electricity bill but it's also someone that SDG&E might not reach, right? Mm. With like demand response programs because they aren't necessarily um, with a sturdy broadband connection or something. So it's really finding the gaps, the hotspots and the bottlenecks in all these Mm. different areas Mm. where um, we see the the value add for what the center does. Wow. So, and and as you look at these priorities, I know it's only been a hundred days, what is your board's expectation for success? What does success look like in a year or two or three years? That's a great question. So success for us looks like bringing additional money to the region and moving right. shovels to real projects. Okay. 
So we are, um, we, as I said, we're a nonprofit that was created by the San Diego Foundation. Sure. But in a lot of ways, what we, do, uh, what we do in the Policy and Innovation Center complements what philanthropy does. So philanthropy right. is in this role of grant making for change making. Right. We're actually designing programs and projects um, that we see as things that will get implemented and built. And right. so um, my hope is that we'll include things like coastal protection measures with the port right. or building retrofits, working with the county and with SDG&E and a wide variety of partners. But I think what will be a sign of success in every one of our projects will be money, shovels, and a wide variety of partners that may not have worked together before. And right. those three ingredients, I think, will be where we have made the, the, um, the greatest value add for the region. Right. No, I think it's a, a a real value add and probably a model that other cities will want to follow. You know, other I cities so. have foundations <laughs> and other cities have transportation planning agencies like Sandag. So mm -hmm. other cities have all the elements of creating a, a, a Detroit policy and innovation center or a Miami policy innovation center. Mm -hmm. um, but they may have not taken that step, that initiative to actually get everyone together around the table to deal with regional issues that mm -hmm. fall fall, as you say, just short of what their transportation planning agency may do mm -hmm. and, and and outside of the purview of a government bureaucracy or a, or a, or a desk somehow. Uh, oh, yeah. So and I that, that makes sense. This goes back, Sharia, to something that you were saying, right, about, you know, government is a place where folks can really be creative and thrive. But I think the perception of it is mismatched to that. Right. And the San Diego region deserves a huge amount of credit for... Yeah putting some muscle behind creating a, a policy and innovation center like this one, yeah. because I think it is, um, it's so often forgotten that we expect government to work all the time. Right. And then if you expect government to innovate, one of the hallmarks of innovation is trying things that might not work. Right. And so there's, mis there's a mismatch, right? Where you never want to fail a community. You just right. don't. Right. And so the Silicon Valley kind of approach to innovation of fail fast is yeah. not something that overlaps with public service. Right. So you have to find ways to safely and incrementally innovate. Um, right. And and the actual creation of the center is the first it, example it's of the first that. step of innovation. Sure, <laughs> yeah. of course. It's like what is so, it? The first, the I first, think, yeah. the first rule of winning a race is showing up. <laughs> it's a show, it, showing right? up. Yeah, right. So, but but I think the region and our local government leadership deserve an enormous amount yeah. of credit for that. So the yeah. folks in the county at Sandag, the municipalities and you know, Chula Vista, for example, right. really took that step forward to say, we're not going to just stay in our little towers or within right. our boundaries. And we are going to actually try to do things that are cross-cutting and bigger than we've done before. And I think I liken it to everybody. Um, if you think about a region like a patchwork quilt, Sure. Where everyone has some of the patches, but no one is really designing the quilt. Sure. sure. Um, it it takes some courage to do that, and so I really do want to applaud our local government leadership for for taking that step. No, I think it's clear, and I think the model. If 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 other regions learn nothing else, the model that San Diego is em, is uh, emulating or really just uh, mm -hmm. modeling uh, is is Sandag's work with the digital divide and getting the region together. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the policy and innovation center. There's so there's, I, I feel like there's this shift where we're trying to get away from our own patchwork and move towards one, uh, you know, uh, we're all part of the same fabric, uh, mm -hmm. the, you know, and w w what happens in one city affects the city next door. Nobody goes through exactly. some kind of a checkpoint between cities. Yeah. Uh, so uh, those regional issues of homelessness, infrastructure, digital divide, you know, uh, mm -hmm. innovation, uh, those are all regional issues um, beyond mm -hmm. the, the capabilities of any one city to solve, no matter exactly. how big you are and how well funded you are. So I think the center is well positioned and, and I think we're gonna be looking very closely as, and supporting, I think, what you're doing in your you. uh, success journey forward. One last uh, question about, you mentioned federal dollars and the infrastructure bill. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, so much talk about the trillions. I mean, people can't even conceive of the dollar amount. What does yeah. that mean? trillion like will i see anything like i say on third avenue uh with, with the 1.2 trillion dollar infrastructure bill what does that mean for us yeah um i think it, trying to follow the news about what's happening in washington these days can be um overwhelming and depressing simultaneously sure. right so yeah. i want to i want to zoom out and say 
there's an enormous amount of good news. Um, so at the beginning of November, the, uh, the Biden administration Congress passed a $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill. So this is the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. A trillion dollars is a boatload of money. Um, and it is really the biggest investment we are going to be making in our communities since Franklin Roosevelt was president. Wow. So very few of us actually have any working memory right. of that time where you know there was an enormous amount of building. There were people who were employed in careers that never existed before, right? So you think right. like the Works Progress Administration. I grew up, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and yeah. to you know I remember biking and walking across old stone bridges that had the yeah. WPA stamp in them, right? Wow. We have that moment again now. And it is the whole reason that I stepped out of my own social enterprise and business to be able to do this work with the center, because I think we have a once in a generation chance to really shift how we invest in infrastructure mm -hmm. and for local government to be able to take the lead, right? The federal government passes these big bills. There's a huge amount of money that gets pushed out. Think about 10 different fire hoses, right? Mm -hmm. But now have way more water rushing through yeah. them. Yeah. Anybody who's ever held a fire hose knows that it actually takes a lot of muscle to hold sure. it in place sure. and point at the thing you want to hit. <laughs> right, right, right. That is now on local governments to be yeah. able to use this money well. And what's going to happen is you will, the big headline of 1.2 trillion is going to turn into 10, 100 different programs that'll be rolled out across the next one to three years. So this is not one big check that mm -hmm. gets signed mm -hmm. right out of the go, where all of a sudden you'll see your street in front of your house change. Mm -hmm. What you're gonna see is a series of projects in different neighborhoods, and this is really gonna be determined by your local government representatives, how this mm -hmm. money is spent, right? Mm -hmm. And so some of it will go for improving digital access. Mm -hmm. That might look like training programs, it might look like new infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. Poles and wires. It could be things like upgrading streets and water systems. There are a whole bunch of things in this bill that are have huge value and massive impact. And I think for um, different types of people, there will be different opportunities. So if you're looking to make a career change, right. there will be lots of new opportunities and training programs in the next one to two years that come wow. out. If you are working in construction, you will see a massive uptick in the number of projects mm. um, and hopefully in your job security and mm. opportunities. Mm. And so I think from my perspective, where this is the most, is a, most exciting is there's money built in to this bill that will let local governments plan for different things than mm. what we've built before. For mm. the last 15, 20 years almost, we've been in a cycle of just trying to you know, scrape by Mm -hmm. and repair things and hold stuff together with duct tape and strings. Yep. And now you could actually think regionally about building new big investments. And so from our perspective at the center, what that looks like is doing things like, you know, working with our commercial fishing industry that yeah. has been experienced a decade worth of disinvestment or more yeah. to think about how do you shore up things like docks and marinas and markets and create new ways that we can build a sustainable food economy, mm. but connect that to things like port security and supply yeah. chain and managing sea level rise and protecting the five from flooding across Mission Bay, right? Wow. So to me, all of those things are connected. And if we're able to do that right, where we can talk about the five and talk about local fishermen in the same breath, then we're using this money well. Yeah. Wow. Well, it, that's amazing. We are connected, obviously, as a society, as, as, as people living in this region. So why wouldn't our policy solutions be connected as well? Exactly. <laughs> Typically, these <laughs> policy solutions come down in a silo and, 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 uh, mm -hmm. and uh, they're, they're not measured correctly. The benchmark is all, all wrong. But, but it sounds like we're moving the region at least uh, towards a more consolidated uh, policy development and implementation uh, approach, which is unique. We don't do that here, <laughs> right? Yeah. So it's, it's a bit of a lift, uh, but it sounds like there's political leadership uh, pushing it and, and supporting of, of it, uh, just like the digital divide conversation we've had. Uh, so exactly. it's uh, pretty amazing to see this. It's very exciting to see this policy center uh, take shape. 
uh, it's amazing and wonderful that they've uh, roped you into doing this and and and, <laughs> and, uh, and leverage your experience with Washington and local government and private sector to mm -hmm. facilitate that innovation. Uh, and I think only good things can come from this. Uh, we've never had this type of a unity uh, mm -hmm. uh, regionally, which is, uh, I think, like I said, if you don't do anything else, if we model regional unity for problem solving, every region in the country can benefit from San Diego's model. That's it. And I think you nailed it in that sentence, right? And in in the, out of the two years that we've been coming out of, 2020, 2020 part two that we've lived yeah. through this year, I, I'm still heading into 2022 with a great deal of optimism. And I think it's exactly what you just said, which is when you think about policy abstractly, it can seem like nothing's working. But when you think about the opportunities to problem solve, we can do so much. Um, so I'm incredibly excited about this and also so pleased that uh, we were able to have this conversation. Yeah, thank you. I hope it's the, it's the first of many uh, because uh, as I've admitted to you, I'm a bit of a policy geek and, and I, I love uh, policy innovation. And to the extent that I can help the center get its message out and focus on your uh, benchmarks and your uh, projects and priorities and help other regions in the country kind of uh, get your, see what you're doing, uh, I'm all in. I'm all in. Uh, this is exactly why I kind of wanted to have a public service school kind of a podcast. Uh, you know, not that I didn't enjoy, you know, my master's in public administration. Uh, uh, it's, I think you're always learning. You always okay. want to grow mm -hmm. in whatever career field, you public, private, you always want to learn something. And the point of this podcast is to get folks like yourself to talk about what you're doing, your career trajectory, and really the value that we're creating in the public sector that others can follow. Uh, and I think we've done that, yeah. uh, I hope, and we're going to keep talking. But uh, Shalini uh, Vahala, thank you so much. The San Diego Policy and Innovation Center is something we're going to watch. And uh, we're going to expect great things from, and we're going to keep talking with you. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>